Hello, it is UKLIFE TV and we continue and our guest today is Mr. Glenn Grant. He is a former colonel of British Army. Mr. Grant, thank you very much for your kind invitation for interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Grant, during your last interview, you said that winter is the opportunity for Ukraine to break Russian army. If not, then Russia will be able to accumulate resources and create problems for Ukraine in the spring. How you, would you describe the current situation? I think that what I said uh, still stands. The, 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 the opportunity has been there, is, is there, um, and and will still be there because winter is not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's still got a while to go. Um, it's been it's been a muddy winter so far in most places, and of course that that always makes it much harder for anybody for attacking, and for um, for defending. <clears throat> and uh, but I, I think that the, that the the bad weather is still to the advantage of of Ukraine. Or I know that. You know, some Ukrainian soldiers have had frostbite and some have suffered badly on the very, very cold days. Um, but also, even during the bad time, the, the, the army has held out ex extremely well in Bakhmut and in, in Solidar and, and in other places on the front line. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the Russians have probably suffered more because of that weather um and and fought not so well because there's nothing you know cold soldiers do not fight well there's no question about it they don't fight well because if one thing they don't move as well because they're stiff you know they, they don't feel so good when they're when they're fighting um so i still think that 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 you know that the the overall preparation of the ukrainian side is better than, than that of, of the Russians. But Ukraine has been unfortunate because the, 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 the Western community has not been as quick in delivering things as perhaps they should have been. And I think that that's not helped Ukraine at all. Um, and it's meant that some, some uh, brigades are going into battle and they're short of mortar ammunition, they're short of grenades, and they're short of other things. I would, though, I might even just make one criticism here, which is, which is that I think that the government has concentrated too much on the big items, the easy to talk about items, like air defence, tanks, and, uh, and 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 armoured vehicles, forgetting that the battle is actually being fought a lot of the time just by ordinary infantrymen. The majority of the fighting is by ordinary infantrymen. And I worry that when people are talking about the big items, that the supporting countries then do what they are asked to do by the Ministry of Defence, which is find air defence, find tanks, find something else. And they're not being asked to find more mortars, more mortar ammunition, more 60 millimetre mortars, the infantry mortar for companies and, and, and company uh, and night sites. These things seem to have slipped away a bit from the discussion, and I think that 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 is a, a that is a problem. That the maybe that the Ministry of Defence has unbalanced its 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 uh, quite, unbalanced its arguments a bit too much. Is my feeling, uh, Mr. Grant? Uh, as for big items. There are some interesting information which we received today from different informational sources, Western informational yeah. sources. Uh, first of all, we know that Britain will send Challenger 2 to Ukraine and thus becomes the first country who supply Western-style tanks to Kiev. And thank you very much for Great Britain for, for, for support. Uh, interesting information we received from ABC News. 12 countries agreed to supply Ukraine with around 100 Leopard 2 tanks if the Germany government gives its consent according to a senior Ukrainian official who spoke exclusively to ABC News. Uh, 
And those agreements, the source said, were made at Friday summit at Rammstein Air Force Base in Germany when allied nations discussed military support to Ukraine. Another interesting information we receive from Bloomberg. Germany uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is expected to give Poland approval as soon as Wednesday to re-export its German-made Leopard tanks to Ukraine. And last information I will receive from Wall Street Journal right now is that Biden administration is learning towards sending a significant number of Ab Abrams M1 tanks to Ukraine and announcement of the deliveries could come this week, U.S. officials said. It looks like Ukraine is getting, is closer to getting uh, Western-style tanks and how it could change the situation on the battlefield if we speak about big items. Well, it's not going to change anything for a few months, that I can tell you, because people have actually got to be trained on the equipment. <clears throat> there is also a danger, and it is a real danger, that, that the, the general staff push the troops into battle before they've learnt how to use the equipment in, in mass, en masse, because tanks like this are not meant to be used in ones and twos. They are meant to be used in tens and twenties and thirties, because that is how you break the enemy. And so, you know, yes, 14 Challenger tank is what you use to, to break through the enemy line somewhere. And then you drive through with, with Leopard, which probably drive a bit better. You drive through with the French light tanks, but you have to learn how to use those tanks as a group, as a team, not as individuals. And at the moment, there's very little team training that is actually going on. Uh, in, in the West, we call it collective training. And, and we learn to fight, we, we learn to fight in the West as brigades and battalions, not as companies and battalions. So we actually use the whole brigade and learn how to, to fight the brigade together. And that means you need to practice that. Um, and the worst that you can do, the, the least you can, should do with these new equipments is learn to fight them as a battalion not as a company, not it, not as a platoon, not as a three platoon tank, but at least 10 or 15 tanks together in one place, because that is when you beat the enemy, when you just overwhelm him with power. Um, so, you know, and I, I just hope that, as I say, the general staff don't move too quickly, that they have a, a, enough confidence to, to hold the battlefield where it is until they until the troops are ready to fight in a proper fashion. Uh, it is understandable that Russia is prepared uh, for an offense. Uh, Ukraine is prepared, uh, we hope and we believe, uh, for counter uh, uh, offense. What scenarios are possible uh, in that situation? What do you think? How how situation how events could go? I think you have to be uh, you have to be ready for the fact that there is always the possibility that somewhere Russia could break through by just you throwing so many people at at somewhere not small that they actually break through or that they get get round behind. And at the moment, they're trying to get round behind Bakhmut and they're trying to get and they got round Solidar to a, to a large degree. But their aim is to try and cut off the whole of that uh, Ukrainian army effectively that is in that, that is from from Bakhmut down to, to Donetsk, because there's an awful lot of Ukrainian power there and they will want to get behind that. But I don't think they can do it very well. So they might break through by just throwing literally seven, eight thousand soldiers uh, in two days in one place. But but they have a, they have two or three problems with this. 
One is if you want to fight with a lot of soldiers in the front line, you also need a lot of ammunition in the front line. And that means that you have to bring the soldiers forward before they cross the front line, because there is no way they can do that in secret. And when they come forward to, to be ready to cross the front line, they will be very large, juicy targets for the artillery. So it's quite possible that actually they could prepare a counterattack and then that counterattack largely gets killed by the artillery before it even starts. Um, but maybe maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe they try in two places. You know, this is this is now strategic. It will be a strategic move on the part of of Ukraine, uh, sorry, of Russia. And we can't be sure where they will what they will do. Because there are weak areas on the, there are weak areas on the on around Ukraine that they might push into, um, except probably Kherson, because they'd have to cross the river again, and I don't think they have the ability to cross the river, so it's either Zaporizhzhny, towards Bakhmut, and then maybe Sumy and Kharkiv and Kiev, uh, but <clears throat> but my view is they will be held because I don't think that they're just good enough soldiers and officers to actually to do anything, um, to do anything developed. What do you think uh, is, a, is uh, the possibility of uh, Russian army, uh, Russian army resources, how, how big uh, they, are, they are? And what do you think about this, that? Well, I mean, looking at what they've shown already, it would seem that they've still got something like 80,000 soldiers that they're training. It would seem, <clears throat> but <laughs> but they might not have. They might not have because that that they're too that the the um, publicity that they were collecting 200, 230,000 might not be true because we simply don't have the the detail to understand what is going on in places. We know what they brought forward. We know the quality of what they brought forward, and most of those have died. What is not clear is what they still have behind that they can bring bring forward. Is it not clear what trained units they still have, maybe on the other side of Russia, that they haven't brought into the argument yet. So, whatever happens, this is going to keep going. I'm sure of that. It's just going to keep going and the numbers will keep coming and coming and coming. And if they run out of soldiers, they will simply find more. Remember that they've only been to a few prisons so far. There are a lot more prisons in Russia that they can bring people from, a lot, lot more prisons in Russia. So if they decide that they're going to keep going with the with prisoners, that there, there are lots more prisoners to be pushed into the front line. So I think, you know, it's going to keep going. Numbers are unclear. Uh, uh, today, CNN quoted US and Western officials who have recommended Ukraine to stop fighting for, for the Bakhmut at the Donetsk region and uh, be ready to a potential offense in the South. It is interesting because, as for me, uh, I'm not sure, but it seems to me that all, you know, military operations and military plans uh, should be kept in secret. And I don't understand what, what does it mean, why we discuss very openly the direction of our possible offense, or it, it's, it, it doesn't matter because everybody understands, you know, the main directions. Everybody knows anyway. <laughs> you know, everybody knows. And do you have to remember the Russians know? The Russians know what they're doing. So there's no secret about any of these things. Uh, and, you know, people say, oh, we shouldn't say what's happening in Bakhmut. Well, the Russians know what is happening in Bakhmut perfectly well. So you're not you're not you're not hiding anything from the Russians. You're only hiding from actually from the Ukrainian population what's happening, which is not really a very good idea, in my view. <clears throat> so. And if the Americans think that the attack is going to come from the south, that, that is interesting because a lot of those soldiers 
have been uh, have been sitting in trenches for a long time. They've been preparing defensive positions, and troops that have been doing that are not good at suddenly becoming attacking troops. So maybe they can attack in small areas, like uh, attacking a village, but they certainly will not have the ability to do a big counterattack. Um, they would need uh, <clears throat> they would need one of their uh, more experienced uh, frontline army units from before the war, before the big war, to do something like that. Someone that's actually been trained in it, because the current most of the current soldiers are pretty untrained. So you know they're good for good for dying, and and fighting fighting like a you know, in a, in a in a in a computer game type fighting, but not, but not really anything clever. Uh, Mr. Grant, do you think that Russia changed the strategy of the war because of Gerasimov, come on, on many, I, many other reasons? I think, I think you have to say yes, they have done in some areas, but 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 you know they've continued attacking the same places since the beginning of the war. Now, maybe that's their strategy, that we just keep attacking the same places until Ukraine can no longer defend. <clears throat> and that is a, that is a, a perfectly acceptable strategy for, for a country like Russia that's got lots of people and lots of ammunition, artillery ammunition. Um, <clears throat> but, but they're not winning with it at the moment. Ukraine hasn't broken. Um, and, you know, uh, so, so that is that is perfectly perfectly well. But you know, does Gerasimov mean a change of strategy? I don't think so. I think why? why? Because he's not a strategist. <laughs> you know, this is the man that that was in charge of the army when it was a failure. Remember this. This is the man who bought a failed, broken army to attack Ukraine. This is the man who doesn't understand that his troops weren't trained. This is the man who doesn't understand that his officers weren't trained. So if you're expecting someone who doesn't understand his own army and he's in charge of it and he doesn't understand the quality, the poor quality of it, do not tell me he has suddenly become a strategist. He hasn't. This is all about power and relationships. This is the only thing they understand is power, relationships, loyalty, um, more power, more, more relationships, <laughs> disloyalty, you know, and alcohol. These are these are the things that these people understand. Power, 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 not not fighting clever. Because to fight cleverly, to have a good change of strategy, you've got to have leadership. And Gerasimov has shown no leadership abilities at all. He's not there because he's a leader. He's there because all the way through his career, he was the man who did what he was told to do the best. Not because he was good, but he was good at doing other things for people. So he ends up at the top. Shoigu says that Russia is ready to create a huge army, like, you know, in Soviet era, million and a half. It's it really seems a huge army, and of course Ukraine haven't. It, it, it is impossible to Ukraine to have army which is similar for 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 that. What what does yeah. it mean for you? And and this huge army, uh, like you know, Soviet style, Soviet period, is it possible for Russia to create such army? If they if they want to, well, I don't think so. No, and I tell you, there's several reasons. One is that they've not got enough good people around to make it. You know, you need it takes it takes 20 years to make a, a to make a, a lieutenant colonel that's actually competent. Um, it takes 25 years to make a, a, a brigade commander that's competent. Um, so they're not in a hurry. They've lost lots of them. They've lost lots of the, the ones who were who were forward and fighting. So a lot of those who stay behind, they're just they're just loyal, you know, loyal tick boxes, you know. Though those people can't make an army, that's one reason. The second reason is at the moment they don't have enough equipment 
they don't have enough of anything to actually to equip the army. You, you know, they can they can make some units with 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 night sights and everything else. But you know, when you reach the stage where you're buying equipment from North Korea and Iran, it, it tells you that you know we're a bit short. We haven't actually got what we need. So they're not going to find the stuff that they need in a hurry because sanctions will also stop them getting uh, the clever things that they need technologically, um, surveillance equipment. I, yes, they may be able to make basic drones and they, they seem to be able to do that. Yes, they can use a lot. They've got some good uh, electronic warfare things that they know how to make. But, you know, when you come to two million basic infantry, you need two million sets of equipment, two million helmets, two million, two two point one million sets of boots, five million sets of uniform, and so on. And it goes and it goes. Where are they going to get that? How long will it take them to make the tanks they require for two million? The armored vehicles they require. They're not making very many a week. So unless they turn the whole the whole of the Russian economy over to army and if they do that it will go bankrupt what 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 limited limited uh, things they have with the rest of the world will just fall apart last weeks uh, putin and uh, shoigu as well uh, say that they are ready for a long war uh, with ukraine and it is very interesting question because uh, it is a very hard period for Ukraine, and uh, we think that we are we don't want to have long war with Russia because different resources and different uh, possibilities. But nevertheless, we understand that West allies are near with us. Uh, but in that situation, long war, long and bloody war is is bad things for Ukraine. What do you think? Is uh, Russia really ready for long war? Well, I, I think so, yes. I think so, because that's the, that's the sort of war they understand. In other, you know, that, that, that's, that's just wearing people down and, and using people to, to actually to kill. Because <clears throat> if you think about it, the resources that they would get from capturing, capturing Ukraine would be huge. No, not just the industry, but the people, the, the, the everything, the resources that, that make up Ukraine at the moment. So it, Putin can, in his mind, he can afford to lose another two million people uh, because he's got that Soviet brain where they don't count. They're not important. So we lose two million and we gain 30 is what he's thinking. Uh, you know, we lose some industry and we gain all the other industry and, and maybe Western equipment and Western technology and West and everything else. So for him, have, going for a long war and, and actually trying to exhaust Ukraine and exhaust the West, exhaust the support from the West, exhaust the support from America, both of which he probably believes will be exhausted because he looks at he looks at Germany and he looks at Schultz uh, and he thinks, yeah, OK, some of them are not as strong as perhaps they need to be. And he looks at Hungary and he thinks, OK, there's two of them. Um, and then, you know, India down underneath me, they're not they're not joining in. So he's got encouragement, you could say, for doing this, for trying to break the West, break the European Union, break the relationships in NATO and, and then take Ukraine. That is how his brain will be working, I'm sure. Yeah, you're right. A long war would not be good for Ukraine. And one of the reasons is, is that Ukraine has not even thought about preparing itself for a long war. Ukraine is still thinking about next week and the week afterwards. The government, the government is not at all prepared for fighting a serious war against Russia. It's still dreaming. It is a problem. It's dangerous. It, and is, it is a problem. It's a it real problem. Is. I think society is beginning to see this now, you know, after after a year when, you, you, you know, it, it's still NGOs buying drones. It's still some some volunteers taking food to the front line and, and, and taking all the, the little the batteries and the plastic and all the things that that should actually come from a defense ministry. 
<clears throat> which are being bought by civilians. And now a lot of people are asking questions about this and they should ask questions about it. Um, not not because it's not wrong, not be because it's wrong, sorry, because, you know, it, when we went to the Crimea, you know, one has to go back to, to 18, whatever it was, 1854 or something. When we went to the Crimea, then Britain had huge amount of volunteer support for that. Um, you know, ship, ships, literally people putting stuff on ships and taking it to the Crimea to support the um, to support the, the British troops there. So it's not unusual. It's not unusual. Um, but but uh, the problem with Ukraine, as it is at the moment, is it is it people are trying to pretend in the government and in the ministries. They're trying to pretend that it's not happening. And then you get the defence minister saying, you know, well, we don't need these or we're doing perfectly well. And you get people saying the military have got all they need from 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 the government and all they need when, when it's not true. That's the dangerous thing, because there's no real hard focus on actually what do we need to fight a long war? How much? Where's it coming from? And if it's not coming from the international community, it certainly isn't coming from Ukarom Brom Prom at the moment. So, you know, there needs to be some 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 hard thinking about what Putin and, Scho and, uh, and Shoigu have said. Does it mean that Ukraine must be ready for a long war? And uh, I, when I say be ready, it means that it is very uh, complicated for Ukrainians to understand and to rethink the understanding of this war, like a long war. Yes, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it, it, Ukraine needs to be prepare itself for, for three, maybe four years more of this. You mean such you you mean such a type of war? You know, very active, bloody, and such. Yeah, maybe it goes to stalemate period. But Russia is not Russia is not going to Russia is not going to stop going forward. You've seen they they all the time attack 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 attack. They will keep doing that. Defend here, attack somewhere else. They will keep going if they're going to have a long war. If they're mentally ready for a long war and they are preparing, then it will be a long war. And Ukraine has to be prepared for it. People have to be prepared for it. And the country has to prepare for it properly, economically, militarily, socially, all these things, just the same way that, you know, Britain had to in the Second World War and, and, and actually, you know, prepare itself and, and build factories and, and make ammunition and, and train hundreds and hundreds of people to, to, to be ready to fight. If, sorry. Well, that's me. If we, if we say about long war and uh, if we speak about uh, support of our Western partners, how long this support could continue? Is it, do you think that, uh, you know, our Western partners will support us as long as possible? Yes. No, I do. And I mean, some, some of them will, will support. I mean, you, 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 you maybe had an answer today with, with Estonia giving all its artillery. And as 1% of gross domestic product from Estonia, that is remarkable. And that shows the level of strength of commitment of, I think, of all three Baltic states, but also, you know, on the other side of them, Finland and Sweden, l literally, they are digging stuff out of, of bunkers to, to, to give to Ukraine, and they can give more, and they will do. Um, a, a part of the problem is not, uh, is not the willingness to give stuff. Part of the problem is actually the time it takes to, to, to get it, to move it, to check it, because they don't want to bring over six guns who, that are dead. You know, that they would very quickly lose their international international name if, if these people started giving things that didn't work. So there's a lot of work to be done with some, some of the older stores and the older equipment. But, you know, th there will be a time when the equipment starts to get less. And Ukraine has to be prepared for that by actually starting to produce its own equipment. And, and you, you saw, I think you probably read the, the comment by, by Dr. Carver in, uh, in America this week, 
No. Just say, no, you didn't. Well, I mean, he's basically saying that, you know, there is a, it's all right people ask complaining about not getting equipment, but there is a degree of fault on the side of Ukraine as well um, for not having, you know, since 2014, for not having done anything. Um, and then some people are complaining about the Budapest memorandum and everything else, saying, well, uh, you know, this is, we signed this, America did this. Those arguments are all foolish because they do not help the army with equipment. The only thing that helps the army with equipment is business. Business, business, business. The only people who can make weapons, business. The only people who can make ammunition, business. And Ukraine has not grasped that Ukrombrom Prom is not a business. It's a government bureaucratic organization made up of other government bureaucratic organizations. They are not business minded. They are not business shaped. They're just not designed for doing what Ukraine needs. So there needs to be a change. You know, there, there is an expression which is, you know, when you're riding a dead horse, it's time to get off and find another one. And I'm afraid that's how I think about, you know, Ukrom Brom Prom. It's time for, for Ukraine to find another system and another way of working using business, using Ukrainian business to provide things and Ukrainian businessmen to deliver new equipment, not through a government organization. As I understand, right. Sorry. Yeah, oh, no, I was going to say otherwise, if you don't start now and it is a long war, you'll run out of time and run out of equipment. As I understand, uh, it is impossible for Ukraine to win the war without our own production of weapons. And this production must be, you know, must start yesterday, for example, not just tomorrow, just yesterday. I think so. I think so. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying necessarily that it's got to be, you know, guns and tanks, but there are lots of things that, that Ukraine should be looking at making the things it can make. And it can make ammunition, it can make mortars, it can make, <clears throat> you know, it can make small mortars, it can make grenades, all sorts of things that are, are quite are relatively easy to make. Uh, and and for which already the, 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 the plans exist in other com in other companies around the world so you know you may not buy the uh, the buy the equipment but you can buy the plan you can start the machinery being made by someone i mean uh, um, one of the german companies was talking about making i mean i think it's german was talking about making ammunition and they they were saying something like you know 12 or 13 weeks until they start making it well you know people can do this in business it's governments that can't do it because civil servants are not designed for fast working. They are not selected for fast working. People don't go into the civil service. They don't go into government jobs if they are entrepreneurial because they know they will die of heart heartache in the first week at how everybody else is working. So Ukraine has to engage the entrepreneurial side of Ukraine, which is huge. It's huge and it's wonderful. There are some amazing people and they're not even being asked. They're not even being talked to. In fact, it's worse than that. Some of the brightest people that you have in Ukraine for business are actually being uh, cut out of the discussion. They're being cut out of the business relationship discussion by either by the Ministry of Defense or by other ministries. They are not being used as uh, as 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 business leaders, as think le thought leaders, as project leaders. They're being cut out. And you've got some of your best, some of the best entrepreneurs are currently in the front line fighting as infantry, which in wartime is not the most clever thing you can do. It was many situations when uh, people here in Ukraine say that it is impossible to produce some weapons or some ammunition under the bombs, you know, because all over 
the Ukraine is under the bombs. And oh, no, sorry, it's not. No, it's not. All Ukraine is not. There, there are a few bombs in, in Lviv, a few bombs in Rivne, a few bombs in other places. There are thousands and thousands of square kilometers of forest, of forest and 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 fields and everything else where there has not been anything at all. All over Ukraine is a huge country. And don't tell me that you don't have underground bunkers in, in, in the Carpathians, because you do, because the Soviet Union always dug underground bunkers all over the place. You can put factories in the metro. Yeah, half the metro station, close one end, close one end of the station and the other half of the station, turn it into a factory for ammunition. It doesn't take much imagination to do things like that. Just a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a thinking and political will, political will. In other words, political decision making and then that the, we must do this. Who and what can stop Putin? Oh, I think it will only be Ukraine, Ukraine beating the Russian population, which will then beat Putin. By beating the Russian population, I mean beating, winning the, 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 the mental and moral battle with Russian population to the point where the Russian population says, this is stupid. What we're doing is stupid. They're not there yet, which in some ways is why a long war might be advantageous to Ukraine if it keeps fighting well, because at some stage there must be a realization of people that it's that this is not very sensible. But I say that, but the Russians are so stupid, they might go the other way. They might just all get, we, we must all die for the glory of Russia. And if you're doing that, then that is a very, very difficult thing to beat. Um, then the only people, it won't be the population in Russia, it will be the oligarchs and the people around Putin whose children are in, uh, whose children are in Venice and they're in Vienna and they're in, you know, on, on, the, on the Mediterranean coast. And then those people might start saying, my life is now so shitty. I don't see my wife and children. Uh, it's time we stopped this. That's a possibility. That is a real possibility. So it could be them that stop Putin. It means that uh, change inside uh, of Russia is quite important. Yes, I think so. Uh, do you think that Putin uh, could spread the escalation to neighboring countries? For example, Baltic countries or, or other countries? Uh, I, think, I think he's got to avoid NATO. And I think he knows that. I um, mean, the last thing he wants is American air power coming over the top of him. Um, uh, but, but, but if I was Georgia, I would worry. Georgia? Yeah, Why? I would Why? worry. Why? You think that uh, Southern Caucasus is... First interested? of all, it's not in NATO. Secondly, there are already thousands of, uh, of, of young Russian men in Georgia at the moment. Uh, thirdly, because the current government is pro-Russian, the army has been neglected the last few years. And, and the better officers are no longer in the army because it's pro-Russian. So they've been doing the same as they were doing to effectively to Ukraine, which is trying to destroy the system from within. So I would worry if I was Georgian. I'm not sure. I think I, I think I would also worry if I was Armenian as well, mm. um, because you know that they, they, they've not been supporting Armenia. Though they, they've got a pact, they, they've got a pact, but they've not been supporting Armenia. So it's a, it's a, you could call it a quick win. Both Georgia and Armenia would be quick wins for them to show how good we are and how strong we are. And in neither case does it affect the NATO, the NATO equation. I don't think they'll try Finland and Sweden, but possibly because they, they, they know they'll get a punch in the face. I mean, the air forces of both countries are definitely both stronger than the Russian air force. Um, you mean Finland and Sweden? Yeah, yeah Finland mm -hmm. and Sweden. 
Oh, I mean, the Finnish Air Force is awesome, uh, and, uh, and 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 in in very very good condition, very good quality, and high quality pilots, and high quality missiles and weapons from America. So they're they're not a you know they're not a they're not a they're not a joke force. They are fully operational, and the Finnish Army is preparing itself hard at the moment including a lot of reservist training and everything else. So uh, Russia won't want to go that way because it could be embarrassed a second time. You know, there will be no three day, there'll be no three day war to get Helsinki, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, it's, it's if he expands it, he's in trouble in another way, which means he's spreading his forces even more. And at the moment, I think he's trying to bring forces back from you know to bring things back into into Russia to use in Ukraine from Syria and places. Do you think that uh, purpose of uh, uh, Putin's purpose in Ukraine are uh, changed, or he still believes that he could come and take Kiev or something else? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think his ambitions have changed mm-hmm. at all. I mean, I think you know the the the, the his ambition was and is to destroy ukraine as a as as a as a country and just annex it back into into russia stealing what he can whilst he can including all the natural gas under donbas and under crimea and 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 the and towards odessa and that sort of thing so you know there's a lot of resources that he would want to to add to the russian economy um so i don't think he's changed anything i don't see any evidence at all that there's any uh, any change of, of overall strategy. And uh, the last question about the Belarusia. Do you think that uh, Lukashenko uh, could, you know, uh, openly, um, you know, start war against the, the Ukraine with his army? I say about Lukashenko. I think I don't think he wants to. Um, because I think he knows that if he does, he's probably a dead man. Uh, I mean, there's no future for him if he does. There's no future. There's no future in the in uh, in, in in terms of relationships with anything outside of Russia. Um, and I think he has a deep suspicion that Russia might lose this. Um, uh, so it's not in his best interests. To um, it's not in his best interest to create what might be civil war, because remember he's not president. Yeah, he's not president. He doesn't have control. He only has control of, effectively, of of a you know his inner sanctum, the people that are loyal loyal to him. But you know you saw the you saw the people on the streets. There are a lot of people who are not loyal to him, and I'm sure he knows that quite a few of those include our soldiers. And maybe some police, and maybe some some others. So, you know, it's, it it will be a huge risk for him if 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 he if he does do this. An even bigger risk if he does it and, and loses, because he must he must be bright enough to see that NATO is on the other side, and that you know this is, and that he is his country is surrounded by NATO, in effect, whereas Russia isn't. You know, the Russia talks about it, but Belarus has got three Baltic states down, you know, down one side, and and uh, and Poland, and then and then Ukraine around the other side. So he's sticking out. Don't believe any stories you hear about. You know, the the, 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 the they're going to be able to take the the uh, the Swalky Gap, the Swalky Gap to 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 uh, to Kaliningrad because there aren't enough soldiers to do it. It's a huge area, and there are not enough soldiers. They, they they just couldn't do it. So you know things like that of these grand plans for the Belarusians to storm across the Kaliningrad. They're not not got a chance. They get they get eaten alive by by the American brigade there before they've got halfway across. And, uh, um, please, the last question: What is what are your expectation about the potential offense of Russia and? Offense of Ukraine. The potential offense. Offense, yeah. Ah, I, <laughs> I think we're going to see more of what we're seeing. I don't. I think they're just because I just don't see the quality of 
of um, of strategic thinking in what they're doing. I think this is like you know that was that expression that you know when when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and I think that they're a bit like that. That you know it's just hammer away at the same things. Um, Maybe, maybe, maybe they've been keeping something secret that we haven't seen, but I don't think so. You know, the American intelligence is quite sharp at these things, and they would have picked it up by now. Maybe they, they can pick up that there's a possibility of a, a of an attack somewhere. But you, Ukraine has still got some really, really good brigades and some really good soldiers, even if they are a bit a bit weakened in some cases. So I think that, you know, it will be more of the same. We only just must not run out of infantry equipment and ammunition, because that's the thing that's going to make the difference. It's important. Mr. Grant, thank you very much. Thank you for your interview. Thank you. No, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Glenn Grant uh, was our guest and we're proud of that. Thank you very much and stay with Ukulife TV. See you later. Bye-bye.